So with the agenda today, we have some introduction of our brilliant speakers. We have Phil Hornby, who's going to take us through road mapping challenges and how you create effective roadmaps. And then a little bit of an introduction to Sharp Cloud for the people in the room who have not seen or are aware of what Sharp Cloud is. Then we're going to dive into the different roadmap visual styles and then into our Q&A session and then a little bit of roundup at the end. So with us today, we have Phil. And when we saw Phil's 12 roadmap issue styles and heard they don't all fit into one system, we got really excited. So we invited Phil to join us because we understand the challenges of maintaining up-to-date roadmaps for various teams and enhancing stakeholder engagement. So in this session, our goal is to show you an innovative method for roadmapping owners to show the same data in different views tailored to different audiences to answer specific key questions and empower you to boost stakeholder engagement. So Phil is the founder and director at For Product People and a co-host of the Talking Roadmaps YouTube channel and podcast. I can really recommend it. So if you haven't listened into it, please do. Phil is a highly experienced product leader coach and technologist with over 20 years in the industry. He has helped thousands of individuals across hundreds of companies, combining technical, business, and human skills to empower teams and leaders. His expertise and lies in delivering complex solutions that elegantly solve customer problems at scales. His approach emphasizes collaboration, context-driven leadership, and continuous learning. And then with us today, we have Jonathan Morris, who recently joined SharpCloud as a solution engineer. He has a successful track record in data visualization, working within industries like renewable energy and finance. His time as both a software and solution engineer has equipped him with the technical and business skills that are key in helping enterprises understand and solve their complex data challenges. And we also have Jason Lefevre with us today, who is a seasoned expert with a knack for tackling complex challenges across various industries, whatever is helping businesses with portfolio management or solving complex business problems. Jason is dedicated to finding effective solutions that truly make a difference. So let's dive in. I'm gonna hand over to Phil Hornby, who's gonna take us through today's session, road mapping for your audience. Perfect. Thanks, Thank Madeline. Time. Time for my slides, I guess. Yeah. And whew, set me up hard. So, road mapping for your audience. There are so many aspects and angles to road mapping that we could go down the avenue of. But today we chose to focus on the audience as a key constraint or consideration in when we're road mapping. And I would hazard a guess that if I looked at your roadmap today, most of them would look something like, this, a Gantt chart, this, a board, or this, a table. And quite frankly, that's a bit boring in many cases. So we're going to challenge that conception a little bit. As Madeline said, oh, and we're, jump, we're losing. Don't, don't follow the message too much. As Madeline said, I'm the co-host of a YouTube channel called Talking Roadmaps, where over the last two and a half years, I've been out there talking to experts, leaders in the product space, product management space, the road mapping space, gathering their thoughts, their insights about what road mapping is for, what makes a good roadmap, how they roadmap. And well, I heard that Johnny's uh, sort of background is in data visualization. It's an area I also love with a passion. In fact, I trace it all the way back to a course I did age 16, 17, my love of graphical and visual uh, visual sort of methods, I think is a key part to how we communicate. And we're going to show you some patterns there as we go along. So I was asked to talk about road mapping challenges, but I don't like that title. So I decided to reframe it as why most roadmaps suck. And in that case, I've got really four headlines that we're going to talk about here. Number one, they are poorly defined. As a roadmap, what the heck is a roadmap? What is it for? 
We ask them to do too many jobs. We ask them to give precision of dates and timing and show direction of travel, even though we know that that plan will never survive contact with reality. We treat them as one person's artifact. They belong to the product manager or the business unit director or something like that. And yet the reality is there's a whole team that needs to deliver against this thing. So we should be thinking of it as the team's artifact. And we treat it as a fixed plan. We treat it as this is exactly what we're going to do from now till forever. When the reality is the plan's going to change. We're going to adapt. We're going to learn along the way. And we're going to have to make changes as we go. We look at it and we realize it's incomplete. It's often missing those internal and external forces, the macro trends and so on that are happening around us that have a huge influence on our roadmap. We miss user and customer needs. We focus on the thing we're going to build, the solution, the technology, as opposed to the problem. We miss risk, research, and discovery. Our work that we need to do to understand the market and understand how to deliver the right solutions when they're probably more critical than the actual thing we're going to ship. And they're poorly communicated. There's no story behind our roadmap. It's just a bunch of things in a sequence, in some sort of Gantt chart. But how it all hangs together, how we look at it and say, this is the direction and this is how we're all going here with a vision behind it and the context of why that makes sense is missing. We maybe communicate it once a quarter, once a year even in some organizations when if we expect people to follow it and be in line with it, we really need to be communicating it more often. We should be communicating it sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, because the chances are the person that you're talking to today is a different person to the people you were talking to last week or even yesterday. And whilst it feels to you like you're a broken record going on and on and on about the same thing, they haven't heard it for three months. And it's a powerful tool to keep everyone aligned and on the same page. And frankly, we don't consider the audience. Who are we speaking to? What do they care about? Showing a roadmap to a development team is very different to showing a roadmap to an executive or a, an investor. They care about different things. And lastly, they're poorly designed, or we could just phrase this as they're, they're ugly. And I know that how the good they look shouldn't matter, but quite frankly, as humans, we like things that are aesthetic. Something that looks good helps us get on board and helps us understand it. We engage with it more. So how can we do better? Well, let's start out by understanding our audience. Who are they and what do they care about? Jana Bastow put this chart together and it's in featured in this book up here as well, Roadmaps Relaunched, that uh, talks about the types of information we might put on there and the level of, of detail. For example, an exec and a CEO cares about high level information. They don't want all the little bits and bytes and the, of detail. On the other hand, a developer, they want all of that detail. That's super important to them because that's going to influence how they do their work. Internal and, in, and public or kind of external information is visible to both of those audiences because they care about it. They're working on it. But if I'm putting a public road map out there, which in the B2C world is not unusual, and even in the B2B world, not so that unusual, then I'm still not going to talk about everything. I might talk about a certain amount of initiatives, the things that I'm prepared to make public, the things I'm not worried about competitors knowing about, or the things that I'm absolutely sure and secure about, because there are some things I want to keep inside my organization. So we've got to think about the level of visibility, who we're showing this information to, but also the level of detail. And I think there's actually a third dimension on here, time horizon. 
the CEO and the exec, they want that long-term view. They're looking for that five, possibly even 10-year version. Dev and ops, if you show them a five and 10-year version, they won't believe a word of it. So showing them maybe a one or two-year version or view, should we say, is more applicable. But it's more complicated than that, unfortunately. You know, we have to consider the job of the roadmap. And at its core, the job of the roadmap is communication and alignment. There's not, no two ways about it. But different audiences have different jobs for the roadmap. And so let's take an ex a couple of examples. Of, in fact, I have four examples in here to look at. But I'm going to tell you now, these are not prescriptive exact examples. They are perhaps your CEO cares about this. Perhaps your CEO and your investors care about high level information, internal and external, and the long-term view. And what they really care about is where is the investment going? And this was really brought home to me with a CPTO that I'm coaching at the moment, where his CEO came to him and said, we need a roadmap. I need to know where we're going. And so he thought, great. And he went away and started working on a roadmap. And came to our next coaching session. And I, as we started talking about this, I, my first question back to him was, what does a roadmap mean to your CEO? What does he expect of a roadmap? And he looked back at me and as if to say, isn't that obvious? And then he started thinking for a second. He's like, oh, no, I don't actually know what he wants. Now, I run some workshops that we call roadmap workshops, but they're essentially a design sprint for your roadmap, creating the right artifact for your roadmap, for your audience. And so in those, I get people to do a lot of research to find lots of different visual examples of how you might look at a roadmap. And so I gave him a mirror board full of these different visual styles and said, go and sit down with your CEO and go through these and say, which one are, give, are giving you the information you need? Which ones aren't? After about four or five examples, the CEO said, hold on a second. No, forget these. I know exactly what I want. It's in the investor deck that we used two years ago. And he pulled up the deck and there was a very simple visual that simply showed three boxes of what I call a territory diagram. And all of a sudden it was clear what the expectation was for the CEO because it was a conversation with investors about this is the territory that we want to take over, that we want to win in the market. Whereas what the CPTO was working on was something much more operational, much more about helping the team deliver. And so knowing that difference of expectation, they end up with two artifacts. So development might care about something different, that detailed initiatives and planning information, both internal and external, and that shorter term, as I suggested earlier. And really, their job to be done might be to inform the detailed planning that they're doing, to coordinate across teams. Then we might look at sales. They need high-level initiatives, too much detail, and you're probably putting yourself at risk in a contract. Um, it's external only. It's relatively short term, maybe to medium term. But it's about helping them win the right deal with the right customers, the ones that align with your direction of travel, not the ones that are going off in a different direction, which is where then the customers come in. It's high level content, but it also needs to speak to specific concerns. Like they may have something specific that they care about a particular piece of legislation, a market they want to enter, a problem that they need to solve. And they want to see, how are you addressing that? Do you have a solution? Because ultimately, they want to know what journey that they're on, and is it the same one as you're on? And therefore, can you work together? And this is exactly how I used to work with automotive manufacturers. So I spent the best part of 20 years in the car industry. And I remember taking my roadmaps to meetings with people like General Motors, VW, BMW. And it was a, an artifact that stimulated the conversation. It allowed us to say, are we going the right direction? That it makes sense to work together. And that allowed us to then really open up that conversation and collaborate and 
often to learn that maybe they had some insights about the market that we didn't, that allowed us to think maybe we should change course a little bit. It was a collaborative conversation. The problem is those different audiences and those different jobs might vary from one organization to another. So the CEO in your organization might have a different set of jobs to be done for the roadmap than the one that I just cast a vision of. And so what my co-host and I realized is we can't just say, here's the perfect view for the CEO. What we actually have to do is say, let's understand that audience. And so we created a tool called the Roadmap Audience Canvas for identifying the needs, the pain points, the information that they give us, the information we give to them, and how we close that feedback loop in the conversation so we can design the right roadmap for them. So we end up creating a roadmap for that audience, but then that's a problem because the, that becomes a lot of work. So I like to phrase it slightly differently. We're not creating many roadmaps. We're creating one roadmap and many views. We create not a roadmap for that audience, but a view for that audience. And then if we're talking about views, we've got to think about how we're going to visualize it. So what styles can we use? As uh, Madeline hinted at the start, my co-host and I derived 12 visuals from the last two and a half years' work. Actually, the secret is I'm going to show you 14 today. I'm going to break that 12 because we found a couple more in the last, since, since I started presenting it and since Madeline saw that pre presentation. So here are our core 12, our original 12. On the left, we have the traditional roadmap styles, the Gantt chart, the board, and the table. If they're working, great, use them. I might say they were boring, but in some contexts, boring is good and boring works. Then we have the next column. These are the ambiguous ones. Where we have a funnel. It gets wider as it goes along. The wider it is, there's more room to put things on. Chances are you're not going to have capacity to deliver everything there, but you're showing optionality at that point. Or we have the crawler. Anyone who's seen Star Wars will be familiar with the crawler. The story goes off into the background. That's a form of roadmap potentially there. We're showing things over time. Now, I've seen people use those where the nearest ones are now or the furthest away ones are now. The constraints of space can work well both ways around. Because now you've got less capacity to do things, but now you have more certainty. So you might be able to show more detail. So you can flip the, the way around. Then we have my favorite of these recently, which is the radial, as I think Sharp Cloud calls a radar diet version. And this is my favorite because it breaks the left to right timing. And it causes people to have to stop for just a second to understand it. It's no longer going left to right, which in the Western world means time. Instead, it's going center to out. And so we have a conversation not about the timing specifically, but about what's on our radar and how far away they are, and therefore how interesting or how much, how we have to deal with them differently. And in the last year, since I started showing that one to people, about 50% of the people I talked to have started using that for their strategic roadmap because of the way it shifts the conversation. We then have some really simple ones, a chevron, a road, or a moonshot, as we might call it. It's sequential. It's really simple. And sometimes when you've got a senior audience or an external audience, that's the best way to go to keep the message simple. We all know that the reality is it's more complicated, but sometimes for storytelling and for getting people aligned on a direction of travel, that's the best option. Down the right-hand side, we have, well, I just had to call them miscellaneous because I couldn't come up with a nice categorization here. At the top, we have a tree, and I, you know, I'm loving that we're going to show a tree view within Sharp, Sharp Cloud because actually it's the first time I've seen one inside a tool. It's often a technique that's used outside for thinking, but now the data is in one tool and that therefore very much allows us to explore in that sort of structure. Or a plot, we're also going to look at that in a few minutes, where you can use an X and a Y to put things on and visually show the different relationships of things. And then finally, 
I mean, it's a little bit like the ambiguous ones. We have the uh, the three horizons. And this is really referring to McKinsey's three horizons of growth, where horizon one is about your core business, where you focus on improving efficiency, driving up profit, and your processes and your procedures are really focused around there. Horizon two, where you're focusing on growth. How do I gain market share? How do I kind of enlarge my business? But I'm focusing on growth, not profitability. And finally, the third horizon, which is off in the distance, the genuine new business ideas, the things that we're working on for the future. Horizon two and three need different process models, need different ways of working. Horizon three is often easy. We put it off in one of these um, innovation labs, let people play around with no process. Transitioning from there to horizon one make, is harder. I'm actually a fan of it all being within the same business, not in a separate in an innovation lab, but that's a whole different philosophical discussion. And like I said, oh, I hid the extra slide. There are two more. Um, there's one called the ter the uh, territory diagram, which has three boxy, uh, kind of boxes coming out. And then there's a domino diagram, um, which has a subtle message of, we need to do this small thing to knock down this next thing and this next thing and this next thing as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger to enable us to capture more value in the market. So yeah, as I said, multiple views is a lot of hard work potentially because there isn't a single source of truth or is there? That's what I believe Sharp Cloud's promise is. I mean, I've looked at the tool over the last couple of weeks as we've been preparing for this and definitely been exploring and seeing that relationship between and across different views, which makes it quite interesting to look at. Potentially, it's a system of record. Potentially, it allows you to integrate with a bunch of other systems of record and provide a system of insight where you can explore that data, which I find quite interesting and exciting. So we're going to dive into that in a second. Johnny, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. Let me <clears throat> share my screen and I'll dive into a short introduction of Sharp Cloud and prime you <clears throat> with some of the information needed for then Phil and I to take you through some of the visualizations he spoke about in that wonderful presentation he's just taken us through. So let's move into a short presentation here. Okay, <clears throat> I'll just confirm that you guys can see the presentation that I'm displaying on the screen. Perfect, so <clears throat> what is Sharp Cloud? And, and Phil hits on that quite nicely, but um, Sharp Cloud, as Phil mentioned, allows you to consolidate information from various different systems and then visualize it in different views. And then that allows you to answer different kinds of business questions and to look at your data through different types of context. And this is often used for product planning or road mapping. If I hop to the next screen here, you'll see that um, it's used in strategic portfolio management, innovation management, risk management, and road mapping. These are just some examples, but it's where we see our, our customers finding great value in Sharp Cloud. Um, so for a bit more detail in what Sharp Cloud is, well, it's a platform that allows you to build custom strategic management platforms. And these then allow you to uncover and visualize insights and answers that help some of the world's most complex, uh, it, it helps some of the, the world's largest enterprises solve some complex strategic challenges. Um, and the kind of information we work with, it's uh, intricate portfolios with multiple layers of complex data that also we find is frequently siloed and then is distributed amongst multiple different projects. Um, our main customer profile cuts across various different industries, including defense, aerospace, automotive, and pharma. Um, but put simply, Sharp Cloud emphasizes the interactions and connections across your whole ecosystem of programs and projects. Um, its foundation is built on the principle that managing complexity can only be done effectively by considering the interplay of your entire ecosystem of projects and portfolios, where you might have people, technology, partners, 
and processes connecting within each other. And you'll find that many of these connections, many of these dependencies um, can't be seen in a data sheet or a BI tool. Um, and so that leads me into what we see with some of our customers in the past. Um, we'll see that they might use tools like Excel, and that's great for inputting large amounts of data. And you might have multiple teams with all of their Excel sheets, and, and that's great. Um, but there are a few drawbacks associated to using these, these kinds of things. So number one, we find that there's data duplication often. So if you have one team denoting a definition of something and another doing the same, there can sometimes be duplication and sometimes be mismatches across your industry. Um, also to, to touch back on that relationship and um, that relationship point, it might be easy to just link one cell to another, but when there's more context and more information involved in that relationship, it becomes a bit more complicated and a bit hard to manage that kind of information in tools like Excel. Um, and, and finally, we find that when our, our customers want to maybe get metrics or get insights into this vast amount of data they have, um, they, they won't tend to use Excel for that. They might do some charts, but they often use PowerPoint for this. And PowerPoint's really effective at giving you those insights and making it readable to perhaps executives who, who don't want to see all the information. But there are challenges associated with PowerPoint as well. Uh, and, and those can be things like, the moment you send out that report or the moment you send out that roadmap on PowerPoint, that information is out of date. So you have that PowerPoint floating around the business now, but there may have been a change that came out a week after. And so you have these challenges such as how do we keep everyone up to date on the latest version of the data? And how do we ensure that those insights are correct? Um, and so then the next step may be that you use a, a BI tool as well. And a BI tool can help you by consolidating information and then showing those insights. But, but again, there are challenges with these BI tools as well, such as, okay, it's great at showing you an insight of today, but how do we start to answer questions of the future? So what if we start to tweak our timelines? What if we start to change our goals? It can sometimes be challenging to answer those questions on BI tools. And so we've got a set of questions here and a set of challenges we, we face with using data sheets, using PowerPoints and, and using BI tools. Uh, and Sharp Cloud can help to address each of those questions. So we'll just move on to the next. And you'll see here that my, my point around um, Excel sheets where there's often data duplication, that can be solved in part by collaboration and, and consolidation. That may be solved by BI tools, but again, Sharp Cloud can solve issues around how do you start to map out into the future. But to summarize, other tools might collect the data, but Sharp Cloud actually connects the data. So once we've consolidated it, we allow you to build out these complicated relationship or complex relationships, and then add the context on top of that. So let's dive into Sharp Cloud quick, quickly, and I'll show you um, a bit of how we do that. So what we have here in Sharp Cloud is a story, and, and this is where we consolidate your information and we start to allow you to build up those views, those different contextual views of your data. So the underlying information can come from a variety of tools. It could be Excel, it could be Jira, it could be Snowflake, a variety of different tools. And we consolidate that and allow you to view it in a really easy manner. So you've got some goals here, some projects, some technologies and risk. And you'll see these similar to an Excel sheet, but this has been consolidated from various tools in an automated fashion. Um, and then as, again, Sharp Cloud is a very flexible tool. So we provide you with the tools to answer your questions and you can build them out as required for your questions. So in this case, you can customize, add your own look and feel and really build the, build the solution out to best answer your questions. So I'm gonna bring Phil back in now and, and we're gonna step through some of these views and he's gonna give you some, some context and, and walk you through them. Johnny, I think you were going to pull up a, just show some raw data as well behind. Can you do that quickly? Yeah, let's let's hop into this Gantt chart and I'll show you an example of the specific data on, on a Gantt chart here. So you can see we've got a variety of different timelines and this is the visual side where it's really easy to understand, okay, what are my projects and then what are the timelines? But again, it's all backed by real data that we've pulled in from various different systems. And this particular view is showing you just the data 
for this Gantt chart. So we can take that large amount of data from across your ecosystem, build it out for different views to answer different questions. And then you can actually see the data specifically for that question you've posed. And so in this case, this is the data for this Gantt chart. Really easy to flip back to the more visual view here. Now, I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with the Gantt chart. So I'm not going to spend long here on the Gantt chart. What I would like to kind of emphasize is that really a Gantt chart is a planning tool. You know the real, most amusing thing about a Gantt chart, though? It was invented by Henry Gantz when he was working on the Hoover Dam, which was delivered late. So that whole, the, the, the plan doesn't survive contact with reality definitely comes true, but it allows you to take a look at how things relate. Now, you can see lots of wiggly lines here because we've put a lot of relationships into here. But, for example... Johnny, maybe you can select for me the net decreasing carbon goal. And you should now be able to see just the, the activities, just the, the things on this roadmap that relate to it. So things like, well, charging point oper operators needing to care about it, or, you know, we've got some stuff related to tax. Now, I will say, anyone who's in automotive, I've tried to make the data set plausible, but it's not, don't imagine it's perfect. This is just example data to show you some relationships. You can see now we're, we're filtering down the view. And in fact, in the top right-hand corner, you'll see it says 125 million. That's the investment to, required for this, or the total value, in fact, of the investment. If we take that filter back off, we can now see what's the total investment if we look at this entire landscape. So we've got different views. We can start to do some what-if analysis. We've also laid in some dependencies, not a huge number of them, but if we if we scroll down to uh, the road infrastructure examples down at the bottom, you'll see that there is a, you should just about be able to make out there's a red line between the infrastructure for motorways and the infrastructure for urban areas. Let's imagine there's a dependency there. And we've set it up so that if there's a dependency and it's not fulfilled in time, we start to see some highlighting there. Whereas we could just nicely and easily, and I think I might even be able to do it with Johnny getting an update live, update it. Oh, it's not updated live. Must Yes, it has. There, there we go. It's just, just a little lag. And now we're saying, okay, we're going to work on this a little later. Now the dependency is safe. It's gone green. Unfortunately, it's now made the access the rural areas relationship the dependency there go red so you can see some program programmatic relationships there between these things but we could just literally select say the the individual items we didn't have to just select the goals we could select the the work items as well and show the filtering there and there uh, it'll take us down to to Lydia. just say yeah. click on the uh, urban areas there we go so we've got a, fil a, a filtered view again now we can see that's if you scroll up to the top, that's driving two of the goals. And we've got a, a different value profile. So we can start to filter out and take different views or different perspectives on this. And that's the timeline. But actually, let's switch across to the tree view, because actually, I think that's the better place to have that sort of conversation. All of a sudden, we've got this big view of all the things we've got, uh, projects we've got, technologies, we've got some risks, and we've got some goals here. Those categories are all programmable because I've been playing around with them. And so we can put different things here. But for example, we could choose to here, because we're, we're probably thinking about collaborations and conversations with R&D here. This is actually my second favorite view because I did say the radial's my favorite earlier. You know, let's let's try and selecting increased road secure safety on this one, Johnny. We should see that filter down. All of a sudden, we've got less things we're, we're looking at again. And here we can see examples of what have we got there in the road safety. Well, some of the technologies that become important. LiDAR becomes important. Telematics becomes important. We're no longer caring about, say, the graphene batteries or the sodium batteries that are on there. Whereas if we went to the net decrease in carbon emissions so yeah so now we've got the ev and battery related technologies coming to the fore because we're thinking about different different things and that might be because you're working with a different group within your r d organization right we know that um 
Decreasing carbon is a is a key trend that we need to work towards. We know that there are probably going to be some other battery technologies. I just put some examples in here. But we also know, Johnny, can you, can you click on the supply chain disruption for me? The, there are certain things that are driving that. And things like sodium batteries and graphene batteries are a consideration because of, well, lithium's got a limited supply and sodium is so much more available. So thinking about those sorts of trends and there are people moving towards that sort of technology, but we can filter down and have that conversation in the room. And that's the power, I think, of the, of the tree view to kind of do that what if analysis, how do they all relate? And heck, we can even add some more relationships in here if we decide some are missing. And then let's take a look at the radial view. Or as I think Shark Cloud likes to call it, the radar view. As I say, this is my favorite. And the reason I like this is because it breaks that left to right, but that's also why I like the tree view because we're not talking about dates anymore. We're talking about the value. We're talking about how we're progressing. And so here we've got time going out from the middle. And we've simply bucketed it into a now, next, and later set of categories. No, no specific dates. But on here, we can see things like, what's the status? And so take out the on-track ones. And let's look. just look at the things that we, we might be proud of or, or a little bit ahead of ourselves or, or behind. So now we've got a, limit, a filter down view. There are things we're saying we haven't started. Okay, when do we need to start them? That might allow us to start thinking about some planning or... Do we need to go and acquire someone who's already doing it to help in our business? Or the things that are behind, like the EVs in public sector, for example, we can start to look there and say, ah, right, so do we need to make some changes to our plan? What's what's the problem? We've still got time. It's in the next time horizon. It's not stuff that we're expecting to deliver tomorrow. Is it on track? Is it recoverable or do we need to make some changes? We're starting to... Think about really where you know, what's on our radar of problems. Like the, the red one is a bogey that's incoming that we need to deal with. The gray ones maybe are some we haven't worked out if they're a bogey or not yet. The red, the green ones, we know that they're friendlies. So we're okay with those. And the ambers, well, they're just sailing around. We know that they're neutrals. So we can kind of take that kind of maybe, maybe I shouldn't be using a militaristic example, but we can take that kind of military view of what's on the radar and kind of thinking about how we deal with these things, how we deal with the threats that are on there. And this is really useful for strategic planners in my, from my perspective. And kind of, I found it really useful with customers and investors as well, this type of view. And then lastly, let's switch to the, uh, the plot view. And so here we've kept it really simple. We've just included the technologies. And so up in the top left-hand corner, we've got the green items. So these are, the status is good. They're in the now column. We're okay. Maybe our 3D cameras and LiDAR technology, we're a little worried about. So they're, they're not quite right. They're, they've got some issues. So we can see that risk-based view here. The sodium and the graphene batteries are away. Are, in the future, but we've got some concerns. This is again a risk-based view and allowing us to kind of think about it. Maybe we could select the the fast charge relationship uh, item though up in the top left, Johnny. And again, we start to see the relationships come through. So whilst we might have a fast charge solution right now, sodium batteries are they going to change that? Graphene batteries are they going to change that? Are we going to have to revisit that technology in order to be able to? you actually work with those those other technologies in the future. What implication does that have? Allows us to think about, again, planning, but also the risk associated with them. And then if we can take that filter away and just maybe switch to a the technology maturity of just proving technology and or technology concepts, Johnny. So now we can start to think about, well, this is really at the conceptual level. This is probably in our Greenfield Special Projects division that they're starting to look at this. Whereas if we go to the system proven level, we're probably looking at things that are already 
well and truly out there in the market. And we we kind of don't need to do too much about. Again, different filters, different data sets. These are not prescribed data sets in the tool, which is what I loved seeing. I could come and add these in and I could take them away and I could change them quite quickly and easily to allow us to then create these views to kind of have the conversations. Because if I really come back to it, just to emphasize that point, the job to be done of, the, of a roadmap is alignment and communication. And we're taking different views of the same data set to really to inspect it from different di di from different directions to give us more insights. Madeline, I think it's about time to come back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, both of you, for a very insightful presentation. It's really good to see. And if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A module. Uh, but we got some pre-event pre that we're going to walk through now. So the first question coming in from Michael, and then we had Roman asking a very similar question. And they are wondering, how do you address the need for multi-tier, multi-dimensional roadmaps so information can be entered once and multiple views can be updated from the same root information? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so there's, I see this as having two kind of parts to the answer. Um, on, on one end, it's, about the actual data itself, where do we actually get this data from and consolidate it so that teams can work on it in parallel. And I touched on that in the introduction a little bit, um, but we have automated solutions to plug into data sources like your BI tools, your, your data warehouses, your, you know, uh, maybe even Excel. And we can suck that information into our cloud automatically and on a regular basis, which then consolidates them and allows the teams to work on them um, at the same time, um, which then gives you the ability to look at the data through different contextual views, which then allow you to answer different kinds of business questions as Bill is taking through pretty clearly just now. Um, but in addition to that, what we've looked at in Sharp Cloud is a single story. And so this is, for example, one story with four views answering four different questions. But we actually give you the ability in Sharp Cloud to work with multiple roadmaps. So you might have team A working on one roadmap and team B working on another. However, you want to understand how these two roadmaps interplay. And so Sharp Cloud allows you to pull the information out of both of these into what we call a portfolio roadmap. And so then you have multiple teams working on their own interesting information, but then you can still get that context and that insight at the top level um, when you start to bring that information together. So a couple of different angles we approach it from, but the the crux of it is consolidating that information and then allowing to gain insights on it easily and, and quickly. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was really insightful. And uh, we have another question here. Uh, we from John. We have internal stakeholders and customers pushing for dates. How can I handle this in a roadmap? have to give the classic answer of it depends. But the, the reason I have to say is that is my first question is why do they want to date? Because quite often the reason they want to date is they, they're actually trying to create a, this fake or false forcing factor. They believe that having a date forces everyone to hit that line and actually often creates artificial stress. On the other hand, sometimes there are real dates that are externally driven. Like when GDPR came in, it was a clear date. We needed to hit it in the market. When electric vehicles become the only new vehicles you can sell, or in fact, zero emissions at the point of use vehicles become the only vehicles you can sell in Europe in 2035 in most jurisdictions. That's a real date that you've got to hit. And so putting dates for external things that then drive things, essentially deadlines, is super important and super powerful because it tells you what you're working towards. But often you're being asked for dates at the point where you're dumbest. And I, and I say this quite specifically. The point at which we do our planning is the point where we know the least. We're the stupidest at that point because we haven't done the work to figure out how to get to the end solution. We've still got a lot of work to do. Often the best thing to do is push back in a short period. Let's say we need a little bit of time to do some feasibility work. We need some time to really make sure that we can deliver this solution and that it's the right solution. Now, in the software world, 
sometimes that's only a couple of days work. In a physical product world, that might take a lot more effort. There's an element of what domain are you working in? If you're working in physical products, there is an element of more planability because it usually got more solid kind of historical data. We can, it's a complex debate, complicated domain, not a complex domain. As in, so we can, through best practice and analysis, we can get to an answer. Whereas in software, we're generally writing it for the first time. And we don't actually know how to solve the problem yet. We can't go back to sound hundreds of years of engineering principles of this is how we build a bridge, for example. And so it's about understanding what domain we're in and what's the right amount of, sometimes the word to change it to for with uh, senior leaders is the right amount of due diligence we need to do to be able to make that commitment and the team making a commitment if we need to have a date, not just say the leader. Yeah, I'd say we will deliver. It's like, let's do the work. Let's make sure that we can deliver it because we've actually all got behind it. But if everything's a commitment like that, then you're guaranteeing everything's going to go to the right because you're not going to be able to live up to them. So it's sometimes about saying we'll commit to this, but everything else needs to be able to flow around it. That's really good, Phil, and it definitely raises a few parts. And I hope John got the answer to his question. And the next question we got a similar question from approximately four people. And it's how can we enhance collaboration among different technical groups through roadmaps and drive impactful stakeholder engagement using roadmaps? So I can give the sharp cloud answer for that one. Um, <laughs> And so in, in this case, it's it's kind of the approach that Shark Cloud takes to this, and it's the approach the platform has in general, that being the that being a very flexible and collaborative approach. So everything we do, we try to make it flexible so that it fits to the data you're working with. And we try to make it collaborative so that multiple people from various teams can work on the data in parallel, and then we can draw those, those um, insights from them. So how can we actually do this in Shark Cloud? Um, you can input data in a variety of different ways. So as I said before, we can suck it out of your systems. You can write it directly on the platform, but also for those, those, those cases where we want people to enter information, but they perhaps don't want to log onto the tool, we use what we call forms. And so this could be a form in the tool that has a set number of input boxes, or we can have QR codes, which you scan with your phone. And so it's really easy to distribute these input methods to your team. And you can imagine, your team scans with a QR code, we verify the person, and then they can add information about their projects or they can add changes that, that they know about from, from their context. So um, just to summarize again, we, we really make it easy and flexible to get that information into Sharp Cloud um, and, and really give you a few, a few different avenues to do so. I'd love to add just a little bit more to that as well. I think all that data is there and then it facilitates the conversation right that that is the purpose of all that data it's about enabling you to all look at a common representation of that data all see it and then one person sees the gap that somebody else doesn't and kind of getting to that common viewpoint i'm sure you've all seen the meme where people all think leave the room thinking they're aligned and one's got a picture of a triangle in their head one a square one a circle well what we're trying to do here is get everyone so they've all got the same shape in their head so we're bringing it all together and kind of getting them into the, the same, with the same visual. Thank you so much, both Phil and Jonathan. A really good answer to that question. And we have another question that it's, it came in from two people. And it's how can we utilize roadmaps for knowledge development and capturing? I guess I would say that's broadly the same question as the last one. It's like it, we're we're trying to capture everything together and bring those thoughts together and enabling us to have a conversation around the artifact. The artifact's not the thing itself. The conversation and the common understanding is the most important thing, and the artifact helps us get there. So it's it's really about using different views to look at it from different angles, and those different angles help us all get to this onto the same page. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, we also have a question from Georgos. Uh, sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, uh, but how can we use Sharp Cloud effectively in 
safe or more generic and agile context? So um, I can jump in and, and take this question. Um, for everyone, my name is Jason Lefevre. Uh, I wasn't on the beginning, apologies, but I work with um, a lot of our clients in a similar capacity to um, Johnny. And when we started looking at how organizations are using uh, SAFE, it, it really depends if they're using other tools. So do they have those epics or those stories uh, already shared or stored in the system like JIRA? Wonderful. We can bring in that data and then use SharpCloud to, to look at that. And where SharpCloud really becomes impactful during that agile methodology, maybe even just with PI planning in general, is understanding the dependencies and the capacity that each team has as they're working through it. So one of the things that Phil demonstrated was a uh, timeline showing the order of events and one of the relationships with red. So if we start thinking about a really agile method of where we're looking at our sprint plans and we could say, okay, well, one team may be overloaded during this sprint. What are we going to do? Well, maybe we move that one of those stories out to another sprint. What's the impact on other stories that are happening during that uh, implement uh, planning session? So you're starting to utilize the relationships to as you make those decisions and start to change something on the fly to start planning what this could look like in the future, then seeing the instant impact of that through those relationships flagging or seeing that um, one of the other things that Phil and Johnny talked about was the cost changes as you filter. Well, so let's think about is maybe the total number of uh, effort that is happening during that sprint or the capacity that the team has. Well, as you start moving those stories around for that sprint, that effort's going to change. And we can start to see what that looks like right on the fly. So it does allow you to be very agile with saying, well, let, what happens if I change this? But then leveraging those relationships, as we showed earlier, to say, what's the impact of that change? Thank you so much, Jason. That was a really good answer. And I assume you would jump in on that one, as I know this is a topic you're passionate about. Uh, I think we have a few more minutes left, so I'm just going to take a final question and then we'll jump into the roundup. But is there a connection to other line of business tools like Jira Confluence to use my existing roadmap in Sharp Cloud? And this came in from Brit. Yeah, so as, as Jason kind of touched upon um, in his previous answer, um, yeah, we have a number of out-of-the-box connectors, as we call them, and I've highlighted it before. These are the things that allow you to pull information from your source systems and sometimes push. And we have many of them ready to go out of the box. In, in this case, Jira is one that we have ready to go. Um, but we can also integrate with um, your BI tools as well. So Power BI, we can pull the information out of, out of your reports. But on top of that, Sharp Cloud can actually render your reports live in, in, in Sharp Cloud itself. So if you have a specific report that relates to a specific technology or a, a project, we can automatically integrate and visualize that report alongside lots of other contextual information. So maybe you have videos that are relating to this and you have um, some documents about research that's been done. So really you can, again, consolidate all that information and, and, and make it available to the user. And then again, you can filter down so you can only show what's, what's relevant um, to what, what they want to answer. Perfect, thank you, Jonathan. So we still have a few questions that's unanswered, but we will follow up with uh, each individual to discuss those questions off the webinar. And I will just quickly share my screen again. Uh, so as a thank you for attending and signing up for this session, we're offering an exclusive opportunity following this webinar to book a complimentary consultation with our skilled solution engineer, Jonathan. So we heard so much from it today. And this gives you an opportunity to dive deeper into your specific needs and challenges and goals to craft a tailored road mapping solution. This link will also be included in the follow-up email that you will receive tomorrow. And as I started, we have had Phil with us uh, today and he's the co-host of Talking Roadmaps. I can't recommend this podcast enough. So if you scan the QR code, you will land on their website. Uh, where you have the option to either go in on YouTube or Spotify or in the podcast app as well to listen to his sessions. And it's talking to experts and practitioners about their approaches and experiences with roadmapping.